Good morning, everyone. Time for another exciting day of physics. Woohoo! Does anyone have any questions before we get fired up? Actually, uh, I have a quick question. It's about uh, my lab and all that good stuff. I've seen like a bunch of uh, chapters, like all miscellaneous chapters are all due or like yeah. past overdue. What's going on with that? I know uh, chapter seven was due yesterday, I believe so, but if that makes sense. Yeah, chapter seven, uh, I would have understood should have been done uh, due some time ago. But what happened is early along, I realized y'all were having some issues getting finished on time. So I made on the week that I cover a chapter, say chapter seven, the, you know, which I'd finish on Fridays, uh, that would normally mean that by Sunday, you had to have the concept questions done. And by the following Wednesday, you'd have the uh, actual practice, or excuse me, the uh, computational problems done. And then the same thing with chapter eight. So yeah, you've got a little bit like that. And I've also addressed the other problem. If, if it's a chapter that we haven't covered today, so make sure y'all uh, remember that. <clears throat> okay. I need perfect. to check it assignments too because I, I don't think I actually addressed chapter nine yet I think it's already uh correctly assigned but I want to look at it and make sure so chapter nine conceptual is supposed to be due the 24th which is actually a lot later than necessary uh it should be due actually on this coming Sunday but I'm going to leave it on the 24th just to give you all a little bit of a breather uh let's see chapter nine homework is due on the 27th again that should be due a lot earlier but i'm going to leave that to give you guys a breather uh the main thing is make sure you try to have them done before you ever do the homework or excuse me before you ever do the test so other than that you should be good to go any other questions all right so we've finished chapter eight now we're going into the uh, chapter called linear momentum and actually in linear momentum we're also going to cover something called the center of mass because it turns out if you talk about uh conservation of momentum uh conservation of momentum occurs due to newton's second law only when the net force acting on the system is zero well if the net force acting on the system is zero that means that the uh center of mass of the system can't can't uh change in other words it's going to obey newton's first law or galileo's law of inertia if it's in motion it's going to stay in that state of motion if it's uh sitting still it's going to stay sitting still so if it's moving uh the center of mass is moving at 30 degrees east of north at two meters per second then it's always going to be uh two meters per second 30 degrees east of north so uh that turns out to be exactly equivalent to conservation of momentum and you're even going to have a chance to see a problem like that i've actually posted it on uh my youtube channel already i may or may not put a link to it on uh your course page in canvas but it's basically a train car solved a couple different ways and basically what we have is a train car uh sitting in space on a train track it's got a a, a large heavy train car a large heavy cannon and a, a large collection of heavy uh cannonballs and what you're going to do is you're going to fire the cannonballs from one side of the train that's obviously going to call the uh, train car, which is attached to the train, uh, attached to the cannon, it's going to shift backwards, and then it's going to hit this wall, and that's going to make it shift forwards, or excuse me, the other way. So uh, all of them at the end of all that, when you're done, the, the cannonballs will all be at the other end, and you can solve exactly how far away that that uh, trailer or that train car has moved using conservation of momentum or you can do it using center of mass and that's one of the cool uh problems that i solved on my youtube channel so i definitely recommend you guys check it out uh so it looks like everybody's just about here we've now got 19 people so i'll reiterate remember our our midterm is going to be monday okay uh those of you who have me for lab today or tomorrow or friday i've decided that i'm going to give you this week uh lab time i'm going to give you to maybe finish up your lab uh that was due today uh i will basically allow you to turn it in as late as 11 59 tonight uh if if you haven't turned it in already most people turned it in already and that's good uh 
but it, like I said, you have until 1159 on your lab day. So if you meet today, that's 1159 tonight. If you meet for lab tomorrow, that's 1159 tomorrow. If you meet for lab Friday, that's 1159 Friday. So I'm, I'm allowing all of you this time off for this lab, this week's lab. And later on, I'm going to uh, have a rather robust lab analysis. So we've done that introduction to error propagation stuff. We've already done that particular lab. Now that you have that, I have a lab that I am creating uh, that's going to have you apply those principles. And it, it's, a, it's a pretty detailed, long calculation. You're going to do it on a, on a single person basis. Y'all y'all can you know interact through discussion board, phone calls, and all that good stuff. But each of you are going to turn in your own lab report for that. Plus, the day off will give me a little bit of time to catch up on grading your labs, which is taking a lot longer than I imagined. So any questions on the fact that the midterm has been moved to Monday? Or the fact that you don't have lab this week. Oh, uh, okay. I was I was going to ask for a little bit of clarification. So there's just there isn't a lab today, then. Yeah, you don't have to show up at all. I'm going to send an email out to people that you know, just in case someone doesn't have me for this class, then obviously they're not going to know. But I'll send an email out and let them know as well. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? All right. So we're introducing chapter nine, uh, which I said is called linear momentum. And I have a little copy of Newton's Principia here. A uh, little copy, notice. <laughs> now, this is actually a little bit longer than it needed to be, specifically because it's got all sorts of four words on the translation. Remember, it was written in Latin. That's why we pronounce that word Principia as opposed to Principia, uh, because there is no soft K or C sound in Latin. So it's the pr Newton's Principia. And that's actually a shortened title, by the way. But what I wanted to reiterate to you is that Newton actually didn't give us, not initially anyways, F equals MA. What Newton initially said was something about momentum. And what his something about momentum was, was that F is not, according to his initial statement, is not F equals M times A, which A is dV dt, or A is D2X over DT squared, but rather he gave us that F is equal to DP dt. And this is what I mean. So he was uh, coming up, let me turn on my document cam. He was coming up with an equation and we didn't really have a system of units in place. So I had to allow for different units having different uh, quantities. And what he said was that the force, and by this he means the, law, the net force, the total force acting on it is some constant times D by DT of M times V. Well, that M times V is what we now recognize as mass times velocity. Uh, so ultimately what he said was the uh, force is equal to K. Uh, again, that's just some constants times D M V D T. So he's saying it's equal to the derivative of momentum, momentum with respect to time. That was his uh, really his original statement of Newton's second law, but we hadn't learned about momentum yet. So we couldn't give you that initially. <laughs> But when you take that and you say, okay, well, uh, what Mr. Younger is calling the summation of the forces, uh, which your book often calls F net, which obviously Newton just called F, but he didn't even use the vector symbol there. Uh, by the way, vectors were <laughs> not quite in the mix yet. Uh, things very much equivalent to it were being used, but uh, we hadn't really had a robust idea of vectors or vector calculus that came along uh from a, a guy by the name of uh, oliver heaviside and to some extent by hamilton and other people uh not that hamilton by the way <laughs> well that was equal to d by dt notice i got rid of the k that k was just because whatever system of units we have determined now that we use a system of units where f is measured in newtons and the newton is defined to be a kilogram meter per second every second uh and because of that the k need not be any value other than one so what it is, is dp, another momentum, quant another vector quantity with respect to time. But momentum for a single particle, a point mass, is actually defined to be mass, the mass of the point mass times the velocity. And the reason why I say a point mass is it turns out uh, this has more than one momentum if it's a point particle, if it's more than a point particle. So a point particle can just move, you know, from here to here to here like that. But if you have an actual object, say like this, the center of mass can move like that, 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 but this thing could be rotating like that. 
And because of that, uh, you have to take into account the momentum it has as a result of the center of mass, which is MV, plus this rotational angular momentum uh, or this rotational momentum, which we haven't discussed yet. So that's why I say it's a point particle. Basically, what you can do is as long as you're ignoring the fact that the thing might be rotating and that rotation doesn't cause any problems, then you can pretend everything's a point mass acting as if it's the center of mass of the object. Okay. So when I put this in, again, in whatever form I use is equal to dmv over dt. If I have the special case of mass being a constant, then that just becomes m dv dt, which is exactly the version we're used to which is MA, okay? So you can see this F equals DPDT is a much more general expression of Newton's second law. And it handles even the cases where the mass changes. Obviously, if the mass changes, then you're gonna have something along the lines of the summation of the forces is equal to D by DT of MV, which according to the product rule, is uh, dm dt times v plus m times dv dt, like that. Okay, so that's the extra stuff that goes on. In fact, this is the rocket equation, basically. So if you're trying to calculate what a rocket's going to do, obviously its mass is going to change significantly over time. For instance, if you look at the space shuttle, when it used to be fired, the space shuttle was this really big, heavy thing. But then you compare that to the, the thing that was on, the space shuttle, by the way, looked like this. And it looked really, really big and that was cool and so on and so forth. And it had these thrusters back here and everything. But then you notice, hey, wait a second, that's trapped on a thing that looks like this. Actually, it didn't come in and narrow, it just did this. All that thing was a rocket booster that was used to get it off the face of the earth. So this thing is basically filled with with uh, uh, some type of fuel, like for instance, oxygen, uh, frozen oxygen or something like that. So you can imagine the change in mass per time is huge, 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 okay? And this allows you to take that into consideration. Uh, another thing that's kind of neat, if you ever want to get a perspective of how, how big or how small the uh, space shuttle was, look at pictures of it on the back of a 747. It's really quite teeny. So that's kind of neat. Uh, all right, so that's what the uh, Newton's second law actually said. And I should allow you to, uh, or make sure you understand that uh, this allows you to study any kind of system, okay? So the system could be, uh, for instance, a single point particle, or the system could be, for instance, a boy pushing a, a cart along a piece of concrete, okay? Or you could even step back further and say, the system is the concrete plus the boy plus the the cart that he's pushing, all sorts of stuff like that. And in fact, one of the problems that we do, and I'm gonna, I'm, this is what I'm ideally trying to make up for your lab, by the way, is if you imagine two hockey pucks, one has a mass M1, the other has a mass M2, and I'm gonna design this hockey puck in a very special way. If you look at it from the side, it looks like this, and it's actually got these little holes in it, all in the bottom but it's also got this little jaggedy point that sticks out in the very center. And it's got a little thing up here on the top. And on top of that is a little more or less rubber tube that come down, comes down like so. And deep inside of here basically is a little metal chain that attaches to that that metal chain runs inside of another little tube that goes up to a power source. And that power source sends on the order of hundreds of volts every 1 60th of a second. Okay, so it sends out these uh, bursts of, of current really, but basically the current's being driven by about a hundred volt difference between uh, the top of the wire and what the puck is sitting on. So this puck inside of that tube is a bunch of air that comes in and blows through these little holes. And that gives you a little cushion of air to allow it to float along nearly frictionless, just like the air track that I told you about. Now, below that cushion of air is a sheet of paper. And below that sheet of paper 
is a, something that's really an obsolete technology for you guys. You've probably never even seen it, but it's carbon paper. So basically they take car, uh, paper and they cover one side of it with carbon. And what happens is each time that lightning sort of strikes from this little point down to the glass under it, that's completing a circuit. And in fact, this side becomes attracted to that side, squishing that little point into the actual paper and leaving a little black mark right there on the underside of the paper. So you can imagine every 60th of a second that happens. That means if you push these two pucks towards each other, then they're going to make a series of dots like this. And the dots will be closer together the faster they are or farther apart, the slower they are, right? Or should be the other way around. Uh, and then they're going to collide. And you'll get a series of dots like that. Well, you can take, you know, say five intervals here and uh, basically measure the distance between each of those and divide it by 1 60th of a second and then add those up, take the average, take the standard deviation, and that would give you a, a measure of what we call V2 initial. And of course, you can define that as theta2 initial, the angle at which V2 is. You can find a V1 initial. And of course, that's going to be at a theta one initial. And then after the collision, you're going to find a V2 final. And that's at a theta two final. And you'll find a V1 final. And that again is at a theta two final or theta one final. Okay. So in this case, the momentum of the system is actually equal to initially, so I'll put a little I on it. It's M1 V1 I plus M2 V2 I, which you can tell is quite a bear when you start doing stuff like this. You say, okay, well, I'm going to say to the right is positive and up is positive like that. And that's, of course, Y. So those are my positive directions. So this has a positive X and a positive Y component. So I'll say M1 uh, V1 I uh, cosine theta I hat minus M2 V2 I cosine theta I hat plus M1 V1 I sine theta J hat plus M2 V2 I sine theta J hat. That's the total momentum before the collision. Obviously, you can do the same thing for after the collision, only in this case, the X component is going to be negative and the, y com or, and the X component of this one is going to be positive. So these signs reverse. And of course, instead of using, uh, well, I should have actually labeled this 1I, 2I, 1I, to uh okay so all those thetas have to be subscripted so you do the same thing and in fact what you would do is then compare uh you could compare the x components uh, the x momentum before the collision equal to the uh or compare that to the x momentum after the collision then you can compare the y momentum before the collision uh, collision uh to the y momentum after the collision or you could just add up the vectors and compare the magnitude and direction before and after or you could take the center of mass, which is obviously going to be somewhere here. And you expect that's going to, in fact, never change. And you can just see how straight that is. That's another way of doing it. But those are all things you can do. And then you, of course, have your normal formulas. Because here's a product. There's M times V times cosine theta. That's going to have an error propagation formula of sigma M over M squared plus sigma V over V squared plus sigma cosine theta over cosine theta squared square root and all that stuff. So that's really what this uh, lab ideally is going to be that I'm giving you today off for, okay? Or this week off for. So any questions about how that momentum works? You now see momentum is something that's directly proportional to mass, directly proportional to velocity. If you double the velocity, you double the momentum. If you triple the mass, you triple the momentum. If you do both, you six tuple the momentum and it's a vector quantity. Unlike kinetic energy, which remember kinetic energy, 
was one half mv squared. Later we'll learn that has a term too related to the rotation of the body. But again, just talking about the center of mass, you get this formula. Notice if you double the velocity here, you quadruple the kinetic energy. If you triple the mass here, you triple the kinetic energy. If you do both, you 12 tuple the kinetic energy. Okay. So that's sort of the concept behind uh, momentum. That's the definitions of momentum. And now I want to talk to you about uh, how we can use that not only conceptually, but in a way to solve problems. So does anybody have any questions about that? I've seen Makita posted something about the due dates. Uh, the chapter eight due dates uh, are still, uh, I think the conceptuals do this Sunday and the uh, problems are due Wednesday. Any other questions about that or about any of this stuff? This might seem a little Greekish, and, and I get that. Uh, you, you now have to, and I would recommend you write this down. Write down the momentum of the system finally using these same symbols I've used, and make sure you get your signs right, uh, and and then obviously convert it to I hats and J hats. Uh, make sure you can do that. So do this. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the actual concepts of linear momentum. It's kind of nice because this can bring home some stuff that you likely, if you've played any sports, uh, have been told before. So one of the things, uh, if you've ever played softball or baseball or tennis, and I suspect they've probably told you something like this with regards to basketball, though it's not quite as important. Uh, they'll tell you something along the lines of uh, hit through the ball, okay? Or they'll say swing level in the case of baseball. And those things are quite nebulous expressions until you get an idea of what conservation momentum says. So if we look at conservation momentum, I'll stop writing the sigma and the net. I'm just gonna write F to represent the net force. What we have is F is equal to dP dt. I can, of course, multiply both sides by dt, and I'd say f dt is equal to dp dt dt, and then I integrate both sides, and what I'd get, notice this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral of a derivative is the original function, so I'm going to get the change in momentum, which is also called the impulse, by the way, is equal to the integral of f dt. Now, what that means, if you take a plot of uh, force versus time, and it might look something like this, where you've got a huge force, but it lasts for a very small amount of time, that gives you an area under it, and that's the impulse, which is the change in momentum, which, by the way, is sort of the most important thing, okay, to hitting. Now, instead, if you had, let's use a different color. If you had another force versus time that, let's say, wasn't quite as big, but spread out over a, light, a lot more time, or even maybe half the height, but this is width, now you see that that area is markedly larger than the area under the little spike. That's because delta P which is really, as always, when you use the delta symbol, it means final minus initial. So this is P final, which is what you're trying to make as big as possible. For instance, if you're playing baseball or softball, there's no instance except where you have these weird rules like, you know, if you're ahead by two and you hit a home run, then that's an out. Okay, there's leagues where you play that kind of stuff. But other than that, in pure softball or pure baseball, a home run is always a good thing. Right. There's never a chance where a, a double, a single or a triple is better than a home run. Right. So the way to get a home run is to have a really large momentum leading the bat. The other part, which is P initial, that you have no control over. That's all about what the pitcher is doing to you. OK, so in order to maximize your ability to hit a home run, you got to maximize this. And obviously that's going to be equal to the integral of FDT. So, or excuse me, that's just a DT, not a not a DL. Okay. 
Well, as you can see, there's a couple ways of maximizing the integral of FTT. You can get a really large F. I say, you know, hit the gym, uh, hit the steroids, uh, <laughs> whatever is your poison, right? Ideally, I'd rather you obviously uh, hit the gym, do some workouts, uh, improve your, your skill, you know, uh, turn your, your, your wrist rollover properly, uh, get that primed properly, make sure you're swinging in the proper way uh, and hit the gym. So those are all ways you can increase the F, but you can see, even if you can't increase the F, if you can increase the Delta T, in other words, the time interval, then you can hit farther. So this shows you that Delta P is proportional to F and uh, Delta T. So when they tell you that neat tried and true advice hit through the ball, You've probably seen this before, especially on the tennis court. You've seen probably, let's turn back to me for a second because y'all need to see my, my beautiful mug. <laughs> now, you've probably seen people hitting a tennis ball, especially when they first start. They've watched enough tennis to realize that topspin is sort of the name of the game. Same thing with ping pong, which I, I really like. Uh, actually, I love tennis, probably my favorite sport. Uh, but ping pong is, is the one that's easiest to play uh, in terms of not having to go somewhere and that sort of thing. Uh, but both of them rely heavily on topspin. And when you're first learning about topspin, you're doing this stuff on everything. Right? Uh, uh, like the ball's coming here, you got And the ball just goes beep, oop, and falls right down, right? That's because you didn't hit through the ball, right? So you want to not only have the ball coming in like this and then go, yeah, that's top spin. Whee! So the ball goes, whee! Struck, falls straight down. What you ideally want to do is the ball's coming in this way. Well, let's say the ball's coming in this way. You want to hit this way through the ball and then trace up at the end. Notice how I hit through the ball and then traced up at the end. My follow through, in other words, what made it. And you'd be surprised, it doesn't take much top spin. I can tell you this because I used to play, you know, fairly competitive softball on a really non-competitive team, <laughs> which is sad. Uh, but I got to play pitcher because I'm the one, the old guy who's really slow. But two, I was also the guy that, that because I played a lot of ping pong, I had really quick reflexes. And in very competitive softball, there's a lot of people that try to kill the pitcher. Uh, I mean, pitchers wear helmets and mouth guards and all sorts of stuff just to protect themselves from it and shin guards and stuff like that. I didn't wear that because I, I'm fast. So people would hit at you really hard. So I get to play pitcher. Well, here's the weird thing. You know how slow a slow pitch softball is? It's like, uh, but just a little, little spin on the ball can actually make the ball do all sorts of stuff like that. Just a slow, slow spin. I'm talking maybe on the order of uh, a revolution or two per, per second, okay, at most. I mean, that's really pretty high, to be honest with you. So that little spin doesn't matter. Uh, uh, the fact that it's a little spin doesn't matter that much. All you want to do if you want to hit a, a true uh, top spin ball is you want to hit through the ball and then brush up. And that's true with ping pong. That's true with tennis. Uh, that's not true with baseball, but that's sort of the nature of, of various pitches is you're actually putting spin on the ball so that it does certain things. If you put a sideways spin and you hold the trip, the threads just right, uh, that can actually make a, a low pressure side that actually makes it curve this way or curve that way or curve downward. Okay. And that's, I think that's what we normally call a slider even though I never was that good at pitching uh, fast pitch. But anyways, uh, not overhand fast pitch, especially. No, especially lower uh, underhand fast pitch. So uh, what is the part of this about hitting through the ball? Well, that's even more complicated, uh, but you're starting to see the, the uh, importance of it. The integral, the impulse, which is the integral of FDT, but also happens to be the change in momentum, is related to not only the force, but also the time of contact. So if you can increase the time of contact, then you're applying more and more impulse to the ball and therefore giving it a larger uh, speed leading the, the bat. Uh, and in fact, at that point, it becomes what good is your bat? And you'll see they have uh, these numbers on certain bats like an Orange Crush or some Eastern bats or some, uh, uh, what were they, D. Martin or something like that. There were some fairly nice bats that you could buy for five, six, seven hundred dollars. And they had like this 1.2 or 1.4 marking. And what that was supposed to suggest is that they were hard enough and springy enough that, that they could uh, 
return the ball at 1.2% of, or excuse me, 120% or 140% of the velocity at which it came back to, uh, came to you, stuff like that. Uh, I, or at least that's roughly the idea that the salesman always gave me. I, I never got to do the research on that, but that is one of the things. So there is some, some component that tells you, Hey, the bat has more ability to apply more force. And that's independent of your, your strength, your bat speed and your rollover, right? That rollover, all of that uh, goes into it, but the bat has a potential to do a little bit better. But if, if your batting technique sucks then the, that $600 bat ain't gonna help you. Right. So, how do we get to this increased delta T? Well, if we want to increase this delta T, they tell you hit through the ball. Okay, so I just showed you a ball coming this way and you hit through the ball by doing this. But they also say hit level or swing level. Uh, the better explanation of hurt, hurt is swing on the ball's level. And in that case, like if you're talking about slow pitch softball where the ball comes in at some angle like this say, then what that means is you want to be in the same plane as the ball. So notice the ball is coming this way. I want my bat to follow through that same trajectory. By doing that, that maximizes the amount of time the ball is in contact with the sweet spot of the bat. Okay, so that's what they mean when they're saying uh, hit through the ball and uh, swing level. If you if you just take it at, at face value and swing level and a ball is coming to you this way, there's a good probability that you're going to pop it up and behind you. But if your center of your bat is in the same plane as the center of the ball, you're going to get that good solid sound that you, that when you really hit a ball, it sounds like, you know, if it sounds like, or something like that, that that's not a good hit. Right. But if you get the center of mass of the ball and the center of mass of the bat aligned up for a certain period of time, you're going to hear that nice. All right noise i'm trying to make it but I, my tongue's stuck bone dry right now so <laughs> anyways so that's sort of the concept uh, of this momentum yes. that's the reason that uh cork bats give you the advantage because the the cork allows the bat to kind of flex a little bit which lets it remain in contact with the ball for longer yes that would that would be part of it plus you've gotten rid of some of the end of the bat weight which causes the bat speed to be a little higher so there's a lot of things that go into the physics of sports, uh, but one of the major things is you want a high bat speed at the sweet spot, right? And uh, if you take more weight out of the very end, but have plenty of weight at the sweet spot, and then again, uh, less weight th therein than other parts, you can actually design a bat that has the maximum swing speed for a given strength, but also has that flex so that it can, uh, so that it can stay in contact with the ball a little longer as well. Good question. De Marini, that's the name of the darn bat. Yeah, I had a De Marini. Uh, it was nice. Literally, the first time I hit with a hit it over the fence. Like, so I was like, oh, we're excited. And then I spent the rest of the season. I'm so excited about my new bat. <laughs> I didn't really spend the rest of the season, but I did, I did, I did whiff a couple since then. Uh, but anyways, there we go. All right, so that's, your, that's our momentum. And we've learned a lot of concepts about that. I've showed you what conservation momentum means in terms of a system of, of objects, you know, the sum of all the individual minimums, which is a vector quantity. So it has a mass times velocity times a cosine or sine to get the component in the X direction, a mass times velocity times a cosine or sine to get the component in the Y direction. All those added up before a collision. If the net force is zero, gives you conservation momentum. And that comes from this. So oddly enough, I, I said conservation momentum. I see now that I never wrote down exactly. I don't remember saying it. So that was, you know, yay, good on me. But as a teacher, that was kind of crappy because I told you it, but I didn't write it down. So let me turn back to my document real quick and show you. So we had that the net force, again, we can write it with the sigma or we can write it with the net. I'm just going to write it with the F. So we say the total force is equal to dp dt. Okay, well, if F net, which equals the summation of forces, which is just the F that I'm saying, if that is equal to the zero vector, in other words, all the forces add up to give you zero, zero momentum, uh, or excuse me, zero uh, direction or zero magnitude and no defined direction, then you get dP dt is equal to zero. What kind of function has a derivative equal to zero? Hmm. 
Yep. A constant? Yep. Yes, a constant function. So, uh, of course, this function happens to be a vector function. So I'll say, therefore, P vector is equal to a constant vector. Okay. That's conservation of momentum. It's as if you got sort of like a Ziploc bag that all your momentum is in. Okay. And that bag can never leak. So remember that when we talk about conservation laws, like we did in energy, uh, we talk about a fixed amount of something or a zero sum game is another way of looking at it. So we might have a baffle, say, for instance, for kinetic energy. We might have a baffle, say, for potential energy like that. We might even have uh, a baffle for uh, rotational kinetic energy or for nuclear potential energy or all sorts of stuff like that. The main thing is all those baffles have semi-permeable membranes that can allow the sloshing of energy from one baffle to another, but the total volume in the bag is fixed so you might for instance squish the uh, the potential energy in other words you're you're falling right potential energy is a measure of your height mgh well if that's the case then the amount of air that you squish out of the potential energy is squished into the kinetic energy well that's the same thing here you have a fixed quantity of momentum and that fixed quantity might be uh m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial vector right and therefore, it's always going to be that amount. So if you come along later and say M1 V2 final plus M2 V2 final, that's going to have exactly the same volume as the original one did. So that's what we mean by conservation laws. I don't want you thinking in terms of, you know, save the rainforest or conserve electricity. That's that's a totally, totally different scenario. All right. So that's why we have conservation momentum is if the total force acting on the system is zero, are very small compared to the forces that you're dealing with. For instance, in a car wreck, you know the force, the summation of the forces is not zero, right? Clearly the earth is pushing up on the uh, cars. Uh, there's friction forces between the tires and stuff. But if you compare that to the forces of impact between one car and another, uh, those forces are much, much larger. So you probably as a first order approximation can assume that momentum is conserved and then maybe make corrections for it because of the friction and stuff like that. OK, so that's what conservation momentum means. So now that we've done that, let's look at an example of how to uh, work with momentum. For starters, I'm going to define or I'm going to let you know that the unit of momentum. Since it's mass times velocity is just kilograms. Meters per second, but you can also see from right here, this is changing momentum, so it has the same has to have the same units. So it's also newtons times seconds. But we almost always write this. It's rarely that we write that. Okay, it's almost always we write kilogram meters per second, and almost never that we write newton seconds. Uh, so those are the units. So let me look at a specific problem. Let's imagine Fat Mr. Younger running. Uh, a little bit ahead of a skimboard. Now I've thrown a skimboard in the skim water. The mass of the skimboard is, uh, let's say, 3.0 kilograms. And in fact, the velocity of the skimboard is to the right. And that's going to be, let's say, 4.00 meters per second. Okay. Now let's say here's Mr. Younger, whose mass, big M, is 120 kilograms. And let's say my velocity is, luckily I'm ahead of it a little bit, but V sub big M is also to the right, so I don't need to write the vectorness of it, uh, is 3.00 meters per second. So conservation of momentum says that P initial is equal to P final. And I'm leaving off the vector symbols here because this is all one dimensional motion. I'm not, I'm ignoring the fact that I'm going to have to move into the page a little bit to jump on that moving skim board, right? So what's going to happen? Well, the initial momentum is 3.00 kilograms times 4.00 meters per second plus 120, I'll leave the units off here because I'm running out of space, times 3.00. You can see 
this is P initial. You can see this is three times four is 12 and 120 times three is 360. So this is 372 kilograms meters per second to the right. Okay. Now P final is equal to 3.00 kilograms plus 120 kilograms, just in case you're not familiar with it. The nature of a skim board is you give it a toss and you run and jump on top of it. And when you jump on top of it, then you and it are stuck together, ideally. Uh, however, with me, it's not always the case. Uh, and then you go ahead we, with each other moving at the same speed again, ideally, and you run off into the surf and maybe surf off of a wave and then come back. Uh, usually that's where I flip over or do something funny. Okay, so what we would like to know is what is that final velocity? Okay, well, I can use conservation of momentum to solve that. I know that P initial, is equal to P final. So I can say 372 kilograms meters per second is equal to 123 kilograms times V final. So I can see that V final, which by the way, should be smaller than the initial velocity of the uh, skim board, right? And maybe slightly faster than me because I was running slower than the skim board and the skim board has a small amount of weight. So we expect it to be somewhere between three and four, but because I'm so massive, it's probably going to be a lot closer to, to three than it is to four. So I take the 372 and I divide that by 123. And lo and behold, I get, whoa, evidently I hit minus. So I just did uh, a zero and it turned it into multiplication, which is not right. So 372 divided by 123 is 3.024, 3.024 meters per second. Notice this is kilogram meters per second. I'm gonna divide it by kilogram, so I just get meters per second after the fact. Any questions on that? So that's like one of the world's simplest conservation of momentum problems. It's almost the first uh, momentum problem that almost anybody does, a uh, conservation momentum problem that anybody does. Another momentum people do is just, you know, compute the momentum of a Mack truck or compute the momentum of an atom uh, moving at three quarters of the speed of light or compute the momentum of an electron moving at three quarters of speed. Th those are trivial examples, uh, and, but I do think they're worthwhile for you to try them just so you can get some ideas of sizes. But I, you know, I feel like it'd be kind of stupid to tell, take a calculus-based physics class and waste time on something that simple. So I jump right into this. Let's look at another example. Uh, let's consider, for instance, uh, a tennis serve. So let's say you wish to hit a serve of a tennis ball, okay, with a tennis racket. And of course, the velocity initial of the ball is zero but you want the velocity of the ball when it leaves to be, and believe it or not, it always has to be up a little bit, but we want that velocity final to be about 120 miles per hour. Okay. Now, back in the days when I loved tennis, uh, which I still love it, but back in the days when I got to watch tennis and enjoy it, uh, I was an Agassi fan and a John McEnroe and a Tomas Mooster fan. And Pete Sampras came on the on the scene for the first U.S. Open that he ever played. I'd never seen him before, but he was uh, he was just you know like he moved like silk. It was just the smoothest player I'd ever seen. Uh, and believe it or not, the only people that that really took him to task were John McEnroe and Tomas Mooster. Both of those brought him to five sets, whereas Agassi uh, met him up in the finals and only uh, played three sets and got his butt kicked. Uh, but at that time, it was a really big deal because all the professional uh, uh, tennis players were were uh, serving at 120 miles per hour, and Pete Sampras comes in serving at 132, 145, stuff like that. It was really a big deal. Now it turns out just about everybody's serving at 140, and now the women are the the you know second tier women are serving at 120, and Venus and Serena uh, and other really good players are are serving at 130. Uh, but this is a, a not not a 
disrespectful speed, in other words. So let's figure out uh, what force is required. I'm specifically going to say, what is the average force required to accelerate this to that velocity? And what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that it's in contact with the ball 0 0.00300 seconds. Okay, that's the contact time. I also know that the mass of the ball, uh, federations for tennis and soccer and baseball, they all make very specific guidelines of the masses and sizes of various balls uh, for their for their league. And in the case of, of uh, tennis, it has to be between like 0.58, or excuse me, between 58.0 gram, 58 grams and 61.0 grams or something like that. So I'm going to go with 59.0 grams uh, as the mass of this uh, uh, tennis ball. Okay. Well, if you take F, which remember that means F net is equal to DPDT, and you just assume this, this serve is going to be all in one dimension. So you're ignoring the fact that he's got a little top spin, he's going to do a little kick serve on it and stuff like that. Uh, and just say it's all in one dimension. Then we'll say F is equal to, if I take the average, I don't have to do a derivative. I just have to change in P divided by the change in T. And I'd see that F average is just equal to, well, the final momentum, remember, Delta P is always final minus initial, or delta anything is final minus initial. So this would be P final minus P initial, which clearly that part zero over delta T. So I put this in, I'm going to say 0 0.0590 kilograms times, now 120 miles per hour is basically, remember we said 26.8 was 60. So this should be 52, 53.6. So this is 53.6 meters per second. Whoa, I didn't know why I did that. 53.6 meters per second. Now, what just happened there was I'm using a different pen than my erasable one and I hate myself for having it. Oh, okay, <laughs> divided by 0 0.00300 seconds. So that's going to be our average force. And I think you'll be fairly impressed with how big of a force it'll be. I think it's 1,070 or something god awful like that. So 0 0.059 times uh, 53.6 divided by 0 0.03 gives me 1,054 are 1.054 times 10 to the third uh, newtons, which is on the order, by the way, of 250 pounds. So that's a, a pretty significant force. But notice if I had made this time longer, if I do that, uh, let's say 0 0.059 times 53.6, if I divide that by 0 0.005, my force drops to 632 newtons. So if delta T equals 0 0.00500 seconds, then F average goes to uh, 632.48. Newtons. So yeah, if you increase the time of contact between the ball and the strings, uh, then you can supply 120 uh, mile per hour serve at a lot less force than that. I mean, this is 60% of the biggest, it's actually less, uh, it was right at 63% of uh, the force required when I only have 0 .03, 0 0.003 seconds. Uh, also, studies have been done, it turns out that uh, over an entire match of tennis, the ball is in contract with, say, one person's strings uh, on the order of a few milliseconds. So, uh, you know, this might be the, the duration of the entire time of collision between the ball and the uh, strings of a whole match. So that's kind of funny. Any questions on that problem? All right, well, let's do another. Now, this one's going to look a lot like uh, a problem that we've already done. Specifically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine a train car moving along with a pretty brisk speed. 
running into a stationary train car that uh, is a little bit heavier. So let's imagine a train car. moving with a speed of 12.0 meters per second. That's pretty fast. That's, you know, we said 26.8 was uh, 60 miles per hour. So this is on the order of 28, 29, 30 miles per hour. And let's say its mass M1 is equal to 2,000.0 kilograms. Again, the 0.0 is just so there's no doubt that I have at least three sig figs, four sig figs in this case. And it's gonna run into a, somewhat identical train except this train is this train car is a lot heavier so let's say this train car i've been doing different numbers before let's say this train car is four thousand point zero kilograms and that's m2 but v initial is actually equal to zero okay now what's going to happen is called a perfectly inelastic collision what's going to happen is these two things just like me on the skimboard uh when they hit there's a coupling that's going to force them to stick together. And now they're acting as if they're a 6,000.0 kilogram object moving with a velocity V final. And that's what I want to know is what's the final velocity. So this is, again, like the skimboard problem, uh, except it's, you know, one thing is automatically stationary and we're going to see what happens. So I'm taking a very light object relatively speaking, and slamming it into a very heavy object. So this is maybe a Volkswagen Beetle runs into a Mack truck. And that's actually a little bit too extreme. Maybe a Volkswagen, you know, a, a Prius runs into an F-150. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and let's uh, assume there are crash dummies in it as opposed to people because that would be just sad. So P initial is equal to P final. Since they're trains, uh, they're again, one dimension. So life is super, super easy. So what I have is M1 times V1 initial, which is what this is, plus zero is equal to M1 plus M2 times V final, right? That's my conservation momentum statement. So what I can say is 2000 kilograms, I'm leaving off the point zero because I know it's gonna reduce to three fig figs in a second. 12.0 uh, meters per second plus zero is equal to 6,000 kilograms. And I don't know why I put the zero there, but I did. Okay. So I get V final should equal, in fact, 6,000. Oh, I got to do 6,000 on the bottom. Sorry about that. Stupid man. Okay. So I'm going to do 2,000.0 kilograms over 6,000. 0 0.0 kilograms. You can see that's one third times 12.0 meters per second. And clearly we're going to get one third of 12. So that's 4.00 meters per second is the final velocity. And that should be somewhat expected because we basically uh, went from one third of the mass to the total mass. So we expect it to reduce by a factor of one third and it did. Any questions on that? All right, we've actually uh, ran out of time now. You guys are free to go. Uh, note the chapter seven, chapter eight, and chapter nine homework due dates are correct, even though I've got really extremely generous due dates on chapter nine. Uh, so get them done, and it's better to get them done earlier than it is later, uh, especially chapter nine, because that's really a long time away. And there's a good probability that chapter 10 will be due uh, really soon. Okay, so, so I'd hate for you to have to have three chapters due at the same time or, or something like that. Uh, remember, no labs uh, this week for whichever lab you have. And I'm allowing you uh, basically to turn in your lab by 11.59 on the due date. So if, if you have lab today, that's 11.59 p.m. tonight. If you have lab tomorrow, that's 11.59 p.m. tomorrow. If it's Friday, that's 11.59 p.m. Friday, okay? But... Later on, I'm going to have a, a, a mother of all error analysis labs that you're going to have to do. And that's in exchange for the time uh, that I gave you today. So that's a lab you're going to do on your own. You can ask me questions as needed. I'll introduce it to you and you can work with one another in terms of asking questions of one another. But you're each going to turn in your own private report. OK, so you folks are free to go. Uh, thanks for coming. Hey, Professor, I need some help afterwards.
Okay, no problem. Who's that that said that? Mary. Mary, okay, no problem. So, Professor. Yes. The mother of all propagation air labs, is that going to consist mainly of like problems themselves or? No, it's going to be, if it works out the way I'm planning on it, I will give you, remember we were talking sort of something like this. Uh, I will give you, for instance, the measurement of this with its uncertainty, the measurement of this mass with its uncertainty. And then I'll show you the little dots with a micrometer or a uh, veneer caliper measuring them. And then you're going to do the statistics, you know, add them up, divide by five or divide by seven or divide by 10, take the standard deviation, calculate the standard error, uh, so on and so forth. You're going to do all that for each one of these little velocities, this one, this one, this one, this one. You're going to take a protractor and measure uh, these angles, protractor measure these angles, and then you're going to see what this quantity is, the X momentum before collision, the X momentum after collision, the Y momentum before the collision, the Y momentum after collision, and compare them with a percent difference. And not only that, you're going to see if this matches that to within the error bars. So remember, I'm going to have a propagation of error that tells me how this error changes. So I'll say the initial momentum is like, you know, 4.32 kilogram meters per second plus or minus 0 0.07. And this will be another number plus or minus something. If those two errors overlap, then you're really, really confident that momentum is conserved, super confident, right? If they're just outside, but their percent errors aren't too bad, you're confident, but not as confident as if the errors overlap. So that's really what it's gonna be. It's doing all that stuff from photos. And video. Okay, thank you. No problem. Gavin, did you have a question or cadmium? Um, I oh, yeah. did. Go ahead, uh, that cadmium, I think spoke up first and I'll ask Gavin next. Okay, um, for that mother of all uh, error of propagations, will that be a, uh, one of the labs we take during a lab or is that completely done on our own? Uh, that'll probably be done completely on your own because I'm giving you the time now, mainly just because I want you to, uh, you know, work with this. I'm still going to give you an introduction to it, uh, and I might do that like at the, at the beginning or the tail end of a regular lab, uh, but I'm not going to give you another lab time for it because all of this is basically done on your own. Okay, thank you. No problem. Go ahead, Gavin. I didn't have anything. I'm just sticking around in case there's a, in case anybody asks any inter interesting questions that I hadn't thought about. No problem. Uh, Mary, do you, uh, you want to offer that question now so I can give you some help or is it of a private nature? I can take you to a breakout room. Uh, probably a breakout room. So it's just going over the lab that we just did. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. I'm going to make a breakout room. Yeah, Professor, and... one final question. Yeah, go for it. So do we have to attend the lab today? Uh, no, no, no one needs to attend any lab today or if you have me tomorrow or if you have me Friday. <laughs> Okay, just making sure. Thank you. No problem. Have a good day. You too. All right, Mary, I just assigned you to room one. If uh, anybody else wants to hang out here until I come back, you're welcome to. I'm going to go into room one real quick. Hopefully I'm in room one. It looks like we're the only ones here now, Mary. So, Never mind. All right. So what I just uh, was saying is make sure, can you scroll down a little bit so I can see your sample calcs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like you put all your numbers in the proper, you know, a font color other than black. That's exactly what I want done. It's in the actual manual. You put it right where it was asked for the data. You have a sample calc right here for volume of the cylinder. And you, you're actually in the process of making the other sample calc that's necessary, which is the volume of the block. So that's exactly what I want. And you don't always have to do it this way with the computer. Obviously, uh, it looks really nice. Uh, and especially if you include units, I always want you to include units. But if you uh, do this uh, this way, that's fine. Uh, I, I want you to also consider just doing it by hand, saving your time, and then take a snapshot of it and inserting it right there where they asked for that calculation. Uh, both of those are perfectly acceptable. Okay. 
but it definitely make sure you at least have the units on the end, but I really prefer the units being in the calculation too. So ideally I'd have that 1.92 with a centimeter next to it and that 7.64 with a centimeter next to it. Okay, would you prefer that? Yes, um, absolutely. Should I change it real fast? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry if I didn't do it on previous ones, but you know. Yeah, I just try, I try to get my students to do that, especially these sample caps, because I want you to make sure that you agree the units work out properly. So that's a lot easier to do when you show it on your sample caps. I absolutely agree with you. Sorry, I was just looking for which one it was, but no, they're all centimeters. Yeah, so now you see that centimeter, the 1.92 is squared, so that gives you square centimeters times another centimeter. That gives you cubic centimeters, so that's exactly what you wanted. Okay, so yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. And then same thing, um, I can just, uh, I like to use this personally. Yeah, the equation just is it looks nice. Easier. Yeah. Um, it's a little difficult to put it on the graphs though, because you'll have to like make a little equation box and then drag it over. Yeah, uh, so the equation the graphs, in Word is nice, but it's uh, it's a little a uh, little bumpy. But uh, there's ways you can actually do hotkeys, and when you learn that, it's a lot faster. You know, learn certain strokes, and it'll automatically recognize it as a as a uh, subscript or superscript. Oh, that's smart. Um, and. So I don't have to fill that in. Oh, yeah, notice okay. you've got the units. So for the slope the and stuff, do I need to put them. the do I need to put the variable next to the slope at all? You should just definitely the put the units. So notice that uh, uh, slope is rise over run. Rise would be in units of grams, and run would be in units of cubic centimeters. So you definitely want to have uh, cubic uh, excuse me grams per cubic centimeter there. Okay, that was something where I'd, I'd probably take off if you didn't have that. Oh, see, good to know. Uh, oh my. Now, was your R value best here, or did you try R value with the R set equal to, or I mean, with the uh, intercept set equal to zero? Well, what do you mean? Uh, so, when you're doing a, a trend line, it gives you the option uh, force R or force the intercept equal to zero. You know, when something has zero mass, it should have zero volume, or when something has zero volume, it should have zero mass. So that that's a data point that you're in some sense allowed to include. Uh, you could be uh, you could strong arm the software and tell it to force that point to be there, and then it will have a zero instead of zero point five four three two there. It'll just have a zero. Uh, if that actually makes your uh, R value even better, then you're fully justified in using it. Uh, if it doesn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, and you could put the data in there too. That would be helpful. You put the zero zero in there uh, so it can try to curve fit that, and that might even bring you closer. I'm just looking up what the uh, density of aluminum is to more sig figs than, uh, than you have there. Let's just see if I can find that so I know how to move that. Because usually I just click on, I go here, more options, and then I click on this one. I scroll down and I say display. Oh, I never clicked that button. Okay, I just figured it out. <laughs> Did you? Okay, good. Yeah, sure. I can set intercept to zero. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can also, in your data points, put a volume of zero and a mass of zero up there and make sure that's included in the graph. Okay, so the way I did it isn't technically incorrect, but I could get more accurate results if I did it. If you read the lab, they did want you to investigate this. So this is something you were supposed to look at. Hmm. But you got a really good value either way, so it's not a, it's not a horrible thing. But like I said, if you look further down in the lab manual, it says something about what about with the intercept being zero. Yeah, um, so I think I answered that in this one um, because I think this one was supposed to trick you because it's like, oh, well, why didn't you get zero? Yeah, um, explain why you didn't. Not, right, is that where it was right there? Since the object yeah, is zero volume sense. should have zero mass, the y-intercept should be zero if it's not explained why. So uh, your y-intercept was not, but it was very small. It's just not, uh, you know, not completely small. Uh, what do you get to make this a little better? Again, this would be acceptable, but if you don't mind spending the time to make this a little better, I'd really like to see what you got when you uh, put the data point in zero, zero without forcing the intercept. Let's see what the intercept becomes and then try it by forcing the intercept equal to zero and see what your R value is. 
Okay, can we do that together real fast? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Just to make sure. Um, the best, ex, uh, the best ex, uh, accepted value of the density of aluminum is 2.699. So that's more than enough sig figs for you. Uh, but maybe by doing that, it's actually going to make this slope a little smaller. But if it makes it bigger, then it's actually worse. I think I know how to do this. I think you just have to try. Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah, undo, undo, undo. <laughs> you can grab I do this every time. A lot, yeah. Huh. Come here. And Control X. Down. Perfect. Yeah. Now zero and zero. And then we'll just highlight. Now you can change your data to include those uh, extra rows. Um, can I just insert or I just do the same thing? Just push the uh, graph. You can't. There's a way you can do it straight. Or, yeah, you can do it that way too. And now just add your trend line and see what happens. And if you turn this stuff in, I'd, I'd be giving you extra credit for this. So uh, if you include that on your graph, that's a, not a bad thing. Now let's All see. Right, I'll make two line. then for a comparison. Uh, look, it looks like it might have hit the zero as a intercept anyways. It did for this one. Yeah, well, now that we put closer, it in there. Yeah. But notice the actual density got worse when you included that data point. That's Let's interesting. Uh, make a duplicate of that and then right click on it. Yeah, and then right click on it and set the intercept equal to zero. Now your R squared value got better. That's kind of weird. So I could just copy. Uh huh. Right click, paste. Oh, that's awesome. So now you can take that and click on the trend line and force it to be, or that plus symbol, there you go, and force it to hit the set intercept to zero. There you go. Wow. When you set the intercept to zero, you get an even better value of R. You got 0.9999, but you got an even worse value of the slope. But also the Y intercept just went away completely because it was zero. Exactly. You force it to be. But it's interesting. That is a more accurate graph, but it gave you a less accurate result. Remember, I said the density of aluminum is 2.699 and you got 2.74, whereas in the first one you got 2.723. Uh, to be honest with you, though, both of those, all of those yeah. values, even 2.75 that you're getting here is not far off. Let me see, 2.75 minus uh, 2.699 divided by 2.699. Uh, yeah, that gives me, that gives me like one 1.8% uh, 1 error. That's the worst one you got. So all of them are really good. Uh, Okay, and like the whole difference basically just comes down to a, a general human error of measurement. Yeah, we can't, you know, see all the way down to not the microscopic that, edge. Yeah, not only that, the, the, the temperature, the density depends on the temperature. So, it, you know, it could be a, a of those. Uh, yeah, if you, the hotter you get, the more the atoms vibrate, so they get further apart, so they become less dense. So, uh, normally the density that you get is at 20 degrees Celsius or 25, but normally it's 20, I think. And in this case, the 2.699, that really was supposed to be at 20 degrees Celsius. And you might've been a little bit warmer, I don't know, but either way, that's wonderful It's well, you know, it's well under 2%. So if you include all those and make any explanations about the differences, then like I said, you will get extra credit. So you can stick those in any way you like. But I'm glad I actually did this on video. Yeah, for sure. Um, now at least teaches other kids. <laughs> exactly. Just so you know, they didn't sit there and Google it and then <laughs> just insert it in. Um, yeah. So, okay, that that's good. That's good. Don't there. forget my, I'm going to have to add in all of these. Yeah. Would, okay, so here was one that I was a little bit um, confused on just when it came to the graph, because I know that uh, uh, we obviously have to switch out what the Y and X values are. And I chose to name the Y value AKFF. Okay. I don't know if that's too long of one. <laughs> I'm just thinking of all the ways I can interpret that. <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Does what the you N have to be capitalized or <laughs> just lowercase? It doesn't really matter. Any of it's fine. You're you're good. I okay, completely, okay. you know, like the idea of you just, you know, knowing how to do it and setting it. That's a good thing. Uh, 
so you got and you made your y variable uh akff and your x variable n that's cool okay yeah and normal force and average <laughs> that looks odd to me i think something happened because i think your slope should have been more along the lines of point two or point three or something like that let me look at your data real quick okay oh well technically it's here too so okay so you said normal force was 3.9 we did a calculation too because i rounded same thing for sig figs let me show uh-huh so yeah, let me see. Okay, so here's the example calculation. So it would be um, 0 0.4 times 9.8 is the gravity. And yeah, that should give you uh, technically three sig figs. So you really should include in that box, that should be 3.90, 5.90, 7.80, uh, so on. So, so forth. How would it, why would it be three sig figs? So it's actually 9.81, not 9.8? Uh, yeah, and that's partly because they gave you this data incorrectly. They gave you this 4.4 as 0.4 it should be 0 0.400 0. i know we can get oh. down to the nearest graph in fact i suspect it's probably four probably about three zeros but it's at least that many so you if that gave you the data as 0. 0.4 0. 0.6 but without extra decimal places then that's our error uh so i'd be wrong for taking that off but i since you're doing an ideal lab let's go ahead and put now the 3.90 5.90 yeah, so this was 3.92. I'll keep it. Um, okay, I can cool. recalculate these really fast if you'd like, or I'll just put Yeah, just make sure you there. correct it because I think that could be part of why you're getting a, a really bad uh, slope. Or I say really bad. It's a lot bigger slope than I expected. Let's put it that way. So you did your normal force was equal to the mass times, that's where you want to put the 0 0.400 kilograms and the 9.81 meters per second per second. You want to put those in there in your sample box. Uh, so this is meters you do meters slash second, second slash second second. squared. Yeah, that's fine too. And the other okay, one, add me zeros is, and put a kg. This is just kg, yeah. Go ahead and add two zeros though. Oh, gotcha, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's three uh, sig fix. The first zero doesn't count. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, so all that looks same good. Thing. And then that's what you plotted. You did normal. It's just equals newtons, right? Kilograms meter per second squared. Right. That's correct too. And your kinetic friction forces were 1.217, 1.975. Uh, okay, so that 7.8 looks questionable to me. Or no, okay, no wonder I was looking at the wrong column. That, that makes more sense. Uh, 2.8, that looks reasonable. I'm trying, I'm just checking that, that your average looks reasonable compared to the actual values, and they all look good. So now let me look at the graph again. So the normal forces should be 3 to 13. Ah, there you go. I think you've got the graphs reversed. That's why. You've got the the vertical axis on the horizontal axis and the horizontal axis on the vertical axis. Oh, really? Yeah. Um. Okay, so man, that's an error of mine. It's a good thing to look out for. I hope I didn't do it on any other lab then. Yeah, um, it automatically thought, takes the first the column as y the first. X. Uh, go ahead, Mary. Sorry. Oh darn. Well, now I know. First column is X. Um. So let's try and do this. It's kind of mini heart attack. I hope I didn't do that on the other ones. <laughs> uh, definitely find out though in about a week or so. Don't forget to change that to three point nine two and all those other values when you redo the calculation. And you can do that with uh, Excel instead of you know doing them all by hand. Uh, yeah, I'd have to add in all the information though, right. wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah, unless you had it somewhere else in another mm -hmm. sheet, but yeah, that's that's good. 5.9, 7.8, uh, 3.92 was the first one, that's what you told me. 3.92, thank you, that's right. Uh, but you can just leave them 7.8, or since you know 7.85, go ahead and put the other one with 9.8, 11.8, 13.7, and you can address that later. Okay, and... And I just copy those other ones in there. Now, if you widen that first column, you can put the two next to each other and just grab the two, and it'll automatically put them in the right way since you got the X's on the four. I mean, the X's in the first column now. Yeah. I mean, just like that? Yeah, and then just move the AKF to the second 
column instead of the top. Oh, right. oh, I got you. Um, no. Get back here. <laughs> control X. Um, there we go. There you go. Yeah, if you need oh, to learn your that control column, X skills. Yeah. <laughs> I've, uh, I've always been skeptical of using the columns, but you're pretty uh, cocky about it and do it, so that's nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been through enough of uh, Mr. Grimes's <laughs> classes. He makes us do Excel left and right. That's cool. So, what classes that? Yeah. Statistics class? Uh, well, because I did engineering, I actually, I almost took three of his classes, but I decided not to go forward with C++ because I wanted to be an environmental engineer. I got you. It's a good skill to have to fall back on though. So if you ever get a chance to take a computer language uh, like C++, do do it. I, I've had a lots of uh, jobs that uh, were able to make me a lot of money uh, in times where everything was going to crap just because I had that extra skill set. But yeah, let's see what your trend line looks like now. Yeah, I, I might have more. to end up doing that anyway. <laughs> yeah. Because you're right. Most of the stuff is in... Um what's the word they're all looking for computer engineers and this yeah. and that nowadays electrical My first job uh they hired me right out of college i was still in college at the fact as a matter of fact i was a software engineer and an electrical engineer which hmm. really my training was all physics but i made a ton of money doing that and loved it i think that's what my uncle did i think my uncle was like a master physicist he got a master's degree from LA. He used to tell me all the time about how he'd like study different atoms and take yeah. them apart and calculate this and that. I was like, oh my God. California school systems are really impressive. Yeah, the point four, that's exactly what I expected for the uh, for the uh, slope, which is the basically the coefficient of static friction, or excuse me, coefficient of kinetic friction. Okay. Mm -hmm. That slope is 0 0.4008. That's the, uh, if you look in the theory part of the lab, that, that'll show you that that's supposed to be the uh, kinetic coefficient of friction. Kinetic that's what your graph is determining. So let me write that down again. Uh, you know, all your labels and stuff were great. You did them properly. You just put your data in, uh, in the opposite order on that graph on the left, but everything else looks great. Thank you. And well, that, well, that's, that would still probably be like five or more points off, though. If I <laughs> thank God I didn't turn it in just yet. Yeah, uh, where it tells you that, it tells you what the intercept is below as well. So there you go, you can change that. Uh, the intercept's supposed to be the friction. I want to say the normal force divided by the mass or something weird like that. Uh, well, they do ask a question. That's also why I need your help. Slope is still. That's a unitless quantity now because you got out Newtons and you put in Newtons. Oh, so it's Newtons divided by Newtons. Exactly. Got you. Um, intercept was. Point, negative point three seven zero one. Negative point three seven zero one. Negative point three seven zero one. Zero. Uh, oh, yeah, I gotta get this. That's easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now go back and I'll fix those. Maybe it was, there it is. Oh, see that right there where it says F over M? That's what your Y intercept is, that point three seven without the negative sign. That's supposed to be. F over M, where F Friction was divided by mass. Right. So if you uh, divide, or, or excuse me, if you take that slope and multiply it by the mass, which was the same for all of them, you'll get the actual friction force. <laughs> Sorry, can you say that again? Maybe I write that down. Since uh, see there, it says A equals G sine theta minus F over M. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So what that says is that 0.3701 is really F over M. So if you multiply that by the mass, you'll get just plain F. Oh, okay. Which is- the That makes sense. Point. Yeah. So that's that's the significance of the intercept on that, that particular one. And this, this, I'm guessing you bolded too, because you wanted us to answer this, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, this was my next question. 
trying to figure out what that is. Yeah, and uh, so, I've given it to you a couple of times, so you probably can know, know from that. Do you remember what I told you the slope was? Slope. Um, Which you know, we're doing some things here. That's that. Uh, that's the friction over the mass. Where am I? Oh, uh, when A is plotted against H, what will be the slope? It's not asking for a number or anything. It's just yeah, asking for variables. Let me see your data table right here. I want to yeah. see something. Oh. I might have been thinking about something else. That's right. uh, Scroll um, up a little bit for me. Uh, yeah, that's for the next one, right? Or is that the one we we're just talking about? Oh yeah, the second one I didn't um, add in there yet, just because I got okay, so this was this one. Okay, all right. Redo right. it. I'm not sure that's what that was. There it is. Was this one on the left? Was it a plot of? Newtons on the vertical axis, or was it acceleration? Uh, y axis is acceleration, and x axis was normal force. Was a normal force, gotcha. Yes, so, the reason why I'm asking is now I'm, I'm double, I'm rethinking my, my statements I made to you. Because I'm wondering if I was thinking of a different part of the experiment. That's why I'd ask you to look at that thing, uh, that data again. I just want to make sure what we're getting. Uh, if n is really newtons, and the, then the vertical axis should be in units of newtons. So that is a kinetic friction force versus normal force. But that's that for that B. Right. For C, it's asking the, the acceleration versus the height. Let me, so gonna, would that still be uh, here? Let me, let me pull it over for you real fast. So would that still be? Um, yeah, hold on a second. Let me see that data table again. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Which one for B? Uh, for yeah, C? for the for the block being slid across with a force probe. Block being slid across. That's the acceleration of gravity, right, on the little glider. Uh, no, I think it's the one before that. Oh, block. Yeah, that's B. Okay. I think that's what you're plotting, right? The average kinetic friction versus that's that. Was... Yeah. So we'll just get rid of this one. So I'm just trying to make sure I told you correctly. And I you know, I hate to have you do all this work and I'll find some boo boo in it later. But I'd rather catch it now so we can fix it. <laughs> so the graph yeah. looks good. <laughs> And that's in Newton's. Good. This is what we got. Did it tell you in the lab what the mass they used was? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh... Yeah. It was for different masses is what they used it for. Gotcha. Yeah, because you're looking at the, I mean, the questions for number C, mm -hmm. but I don't know like what if it's relative to B or if it's going to be the same kind of concept.
Ah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, so. Yeah, because he's asking what the slope would be if it's acceleration. Yeah, for this part where you're just doing the kinetic friction, uh, like I said, I was right. The that slope is really the uh, the coefficient of static friction, or excuse me, kinetic friction. Because notice if you multiply the static coefficient of friction or the kinetic coefficient of friction in this case times the normal force, which is what you put on the, the equation there, you get the actual mm -hmm. friction force. So that part on the end is the friction force, which remember is mu static times m times g. And if you divide that by m, then you just get mu static times g. So that 0 0.3701 should be essentially your slope times 9.8. And if you do that multiplication, you do 0 0.4008 uh, times 9.8, you'll get pretty close to 0 0.37. That's what I was double checking on. So everything looks, looks kosher or correct in here. Kosher means a lot of different things to us non-Jewish people, I guess. <laughs> we have to use the phrase kosher. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was seeing. So if you take this one and just multiply it by nine by eight, you actually get the this normal force number right here. Uh, you get uh, you get that point. Uh, excuse me. If you take the point four zero, or excuse me, the point three seven zero one, that's supposed to be point four zero eight uh, zero zero eight times nine point eight. I'm saying that because I didn't. I didn't, I didn't get that. Because uh, if you look at that equation where we were looking in the lab manual just now, mm -hmm. it said g sine theta minus f over m. Yeah. Well, the friction force. If you if you write f over m, you'll see that f is mu static, or excuse me, mu kinetic. I keep saying kin uh, static for some reason. It's mu <laughs> kinetic <laughs> times the normal force, which is mg. But mu mg divided by m is just mu times g. So that's what that's why that 0 0.3701 should be about 0 0.4008 times 9.8. Okay. I got 3.9, which actually, if I did the proper number of sig figs, it's probably 4.0, 0, 0.40, something like that. That actually might even get closer to the 3.7 or the 0.37. Okay, uh, I think I kind of got those numbers. The concepts are a little confusing, but what, what's mu? Mu is that static or kinetic coefficient of friction. So uh, if you remember in class, we said the friction force, if it's sitting still, it's less than or equal to mu static times the normal force. That's, that's the definition of the maximum uh, static friction you can have. However, if it's moving, then it's always equal to mu static times the normal force. Since this was on a horizontal table, we know the normal force is just mg. So your friction, the lowercase f in the, in the lab manual, that friction force is actually mu times m times g. Okay. And what, you, what you're saying is my mu times m times g experimentally is what you put on the vertical axis. And my m times g is what I put on the horizontal axis. So the slope is going to give me the mu, but the uh, intercept is going to give me the mu times g, basically. And then divide by the mu, you just get the mg. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, so don't forget uh, to put another is, digit uh, in the normal force on that table eventually. I mean, you don't have to do it now, but make sure you, you put that other digit by knowing, you know, that it's 9.8 times whatever. The same thing with the 9.8 one and the 11.8 and 13.7, uh, if you can. I'll go. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. It doesn't matter if it's not right in there. As long as you've got it in the table uh, with the proper sig figs, then that, that won't count against you. I know that Excel does that stupid stuff unless you set it to have four decimal places. Yeah. Okay, um, I think I, I think I get it a little better. Okay. For the acceleration of gravity one. Yeah. So this is the this is the one that I was I guess really having some issues with because my percent error was also wrong. Well, first of all, I didn't understand this. Um. Uh, like a plotted against h would that would just be 
Okay, so let me explain what that is. Uh, this one is, uh, if you look up above, it says mg sine theta minus f is equal to ma. Mass yeah. times acceleration. Right, that's just Newton's second law. It says that the component of force parallel to the incline, uh, the component of the weight parallel to the incline is mg sine theta, but it's going downhill with a friction force pushing up on it, and that friction force is f. Right? So now if you uh, so gravity is pushing that, down and the friction force is pushing back up since it's going downwards. Exactly. So if you divide that okay. whole equation, that first one up there by big M, you'll get G sine theta minus F over M is equal to A. And it's that's the second equation. Yeah, you see that? Yeah. Now here's the trick. The uh, length, the, the hypotenuse of the incline is set to one meter. They always measure that over a distance of one meter. And that's the hypotenuse. So sine theta is opposite, which is the height, over the hypotenuse, which is one meter. So, so it will can... just be the height. Exactly. Oh, okay. So this so that's one all the slope gonna... is, it's just the height then. The, yeah, the, the slope is, is equivalent to the, well, actually, no, it's the height is equivalent to the uh, sine theta. The intercept, or excuse me, the slope on the equation, the G, because you're going to plot H on the horizontal axis and you're going to plot A on the vertical axis, the G is actually 9.8. So you should, when you graph that, you should get something close to 9.80. Okay. Yeah, I definitely messed up. So yes, this would be equivalent to gravity then. Exactly. The slope should be around yeah, 9.8. You'll see mine. Mine, mine's got like a 0 0.0. Like it's definitely... Yeah, I bet you got your um, axes backwards again. You probably got your vertical data on your horizontal axis and vice versa. Yep. I'll just write this in. See approximately. Um, and then the y intercept is just the height. Yeah. That makes sense. And you did say it's okay for me to post this video on my YouTube channel, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's educational, why not? Yeah. Uh, I guess like initial height if it's the Y intercept. And there is. So it looks like your data, your heights are right. They're, you know, nine millimeters, 18 millimeters 27 millimeters so on and so forth uh you're getting your accelerations you're taking the average those averages look comparable to the value so i think you did all that process right you've already shown me one calculation okay. of average somewhere so you don't have to do another one i did, don't have to do it for this one did you do one on the um part a or part b or one of the previous parts because yeah just trial one, one two three and then divided by three yeah if you showed me one of those you don't have to show that acceleration here I mean, okay, that averaging wonderful. process here. You ready to see my messed up graph? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's abysmal. <laughs> you can click on that plus on the side and it'll actually switch the data for you. You don't have to make a whole new graph. Click that. Oh, and that and actually, it might be the little funnel thing. I'm not sure. But yeah, try the trend line and see if they let you change the, uh, see if they let you change the data. Can't remember where it's at. Uh, hold on, my, my little zoom one is in the way of that chart that I just saw. Okay, yeah, so this isn't the one that lets you choose the data. Maybe it's yes. the paintbrush or the... Uh, uh, I feel like you can swap this series. Uh, Right-click on the vertical axis numbers. There you go, say uh, select data. That's the, that's the one you want. Yeah. Yeah, so oh. you can see uh, sheet A1, uh, sheet three, A1 through B S7. Uh, this is what I had at first. Yeah, because you have it in the opposite order. So switch row and column, you should be able to click on that and that should give it to you. Yeah, I did look like it's doing something funny back there. Whoa, what did it do with that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was including all these series individually. Um, okay, so that is a good X value, or excuse me, that's a good Y value, and it's got that reverse right now. 
Yeah, it might be easier to just make it another one, huh? Yeah. Put it in the opposite order. <laughs> yeah, cut and paste like the right side. <laughs> Ta-da! Just like that. It's just a bummer. I know you got your graphs looking nice. It's kind of a bummer when you have to redo the whole thing. Yeah, but you know what? Practice is what makes it so nice. So <laughs> just gotta make sure I don't forget what I did last time. <laughs> All right, let's uh display, display. Okay. Uh, and here I'm still getting this at 0 0.0878x, which is still very off from the 9.8. Vertical gravity. acceleration. Oh, I remembered uh, you, your mass was in, you said your mass was 286 kilograms. That's not right. Uh, you're off by a factor of a thousand on that. So that could be part of the problem. Oh, really? Oh, well, I checked it on the addendum. Let me pull that okay, up. Maybe you, that. yeah, maybe you. I just uh, quickly saw when you looked at your data, yeah, that's grams, not kilograms, but you have it somewhere in your lab manual listed as 286.3 kilograms. I'm wondering, I'm hoping that you didn't use that, but you might have. Yeah, I just used grams. I didn't put the kilograms in, so that would be 0.2863. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, that, that looks good there. So when you did the height, that should be nine millimeters. When you did these, these should be meters per second every second. So this I would um, times by a thousand all of these and then do the calculation again. Uh, no, um, all those should be right mm -hmm. already. Is that the data that, that we gave you, the 0 0.009? Or did I tell you it was nine millimeters or point at, 0.9 centimeters or what? Meters. Height and meters. Okay, so that's all right. And then all those trials are right. You got 0 0.07, 0 0.0791, 0 0.0795. For, okay, now let's look back at the, the graph data. I just want to make sure we had everything. Yeah, that all looks about right. So, so all oh, that should be good. Yeah, I don't think you use the mass anywhere. Uh, later you will when you multiply, you'll use that mass and multiply it by uh, the intercept. And that'll give you the coefficient of static friction times g. But anyways, that's that's that. So now let me look at your graph again mm -hmm. and see what's going on. Yeah. So there's the height and there's the mean acceleration. And your height. A oh, random question. Yes. Before the title too, it's always y-axis versus x-axis, right? Yes. Y versus x. Did that right? Now this is, it's saying, okay, so it's about point nine. So, so oh, okay, I think your graph is graphing the column numbers. I don't think it graphs. Notice they're sitting right on one, two, three, and four. They're graph the X is being used as the column numbers, not the, or excuse me, the uh, row numbers. That's the problem with that graph. Let's, let's see I don't know why it did that, but that appears to be what's going on. That is no bueno. <laughs> you don't sound Hispanic, but you never got a Hispanic last name there. Oh. <laughs> I know, my mom's Mexican and my dad's Puerto Rican. None of them could speak a lick of Spanish, though. <laughs> oh, really? So that's why, okay. I just figured you married yep. someone that was Hispanic. <sighs> no. Single life. <laughs> we used to right, there, you get there. Look there you go. There that's, we go. That's G. That looks a lot better as G, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's really funky. I don't know when that was happening. Yeah, Excel does that sometimes. It'll take the row numbers, but it, I don't know why it does it at the times it does it. Now it looks like you actually have the acceleration on the vertical axis, so I agree with that. And so this one, I still would do the percent error again for this question, right? Because it's going to be, I'm assuming, a little bit different. I think they asked. Yeah, well, basically that 9.75 is supposed to be compared to 9.80. And believe it or not, that's really good data. That's uh, that's not off by a lot. Okay, so let's see really fast. Um, oh, there you go. So smart, I already copied it. It's literally a half a percent error. 9.7543. Uh, 
point is to replace date and we'll have all the other eight zero. Go ahead and add a zero there. on there and put parentheses around those numbers and put meters per second per second after the parentheses because you really should have the units in your there you go. Now uh you well, you can do well, that in right. the other one, but you uh you could just put it outside parentheses if you wanted and it would go to both of them, but whichever way you want sign with me. Oh, you know why? It says I use the um it does that oh, sometimes it auto corrects when you use the equation. Yeah. This is meters per second squared as well, yes. Yeah. And it automatically converted it to the uh, proper form. That's cool. Yeah, that's why I like using the equation one up there. And put that because I just use the, the fractional thing and it naturally does that. Or you can copy the, the second term if you want, but yeah, that's good. Awesome. So now you've calculated a percent error. I assume you didn't do one before, but if you had done one before, even if it's something different, you don't have to include that on this this one. But if you did, I'm not going to take all for it. I'm just saying that you don't have to once you've done one. Oh, okay. But I get 0.5. Yeah, well, the, the one that I tried to do for this one, obviously, it was like 99% error. So <laughs> yeah, this one this comes out to be 0.510. That one's about, uh, I'd say. Uh, oh no, it's so would you go to the second or would you go to the fourth um, uh, decimal place? Seven now it's subtraction seven, that is division. Uh, or three is what you use. Uh minus nine point eight. Yeah, so I'm always so, a little confused with sig figs when it comes to like doing these multiple ones because obviously in a calculation you don't want to drop off. Yes. necessarily those extra significant figures just yet right so what the rules significant don't. rules digit rules tell you for this numerator is notice when you take 9.8 minus 9.7543 only the second decimal place is relevant i mean is uh significant so you end up reducing it to one sig fig so you should call that 0 0.046 on the top and then you're going to divide that by 9.8. 0 0.046. Yeah, it's 457. Oh. Yeah, you can oh, do because that's two. Right. But right. The zero before the four six is not counted past right. the period. Okay. So this would be, I'd have to add like one more. It'd have to be like four seven. Okay. So okay, now. Cool. Uh, that's not a percent error until you move the decimal two places to the right. So you should probably erase those two zeros and just put a percent symbol after the four seven. And really, uh, you oh, yeah, normally right. just report that to one sig fig. So you'd call it 0.5, but it, it's fine. I'm not going to take off for that. Uh, but generally, yeah, that should be called just 0.5%. That's the, the rule. Does it, oh, because the zero at the end of the 9.80 doesn't count either. No, the, the zero at the 9.8 does count, but the problem is when you did the subtraction in the numerator, that reduced you to one sig fig now. How does that work? Seven, five, four, three, because there's there's five sig figs and then there's... Remember when you're adding or subtracting, you don't count sig figs, you count decimal places. Okay, so there'd be four decimal places and then two. But the smallest is only two, right? So you only get two decimal yeah. places, which means only the first digit after the decimal and then a zero, which is like 0 0.04. So only the four really counted. And then you divided that by 9.8, uh, which meant you should only report one sig fig, so it'd be 0.5%. Okay. 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 If you ever okay, want to show you. all the digits, you can do that and just underline the ones that aren't significant. So you could call that 0.4. I think I got 0.466326. So you could call it 0.466 and just underline the six and six. And I'd know that you're saying, oh, these aren't significant, but in case you wouldn't know what they were, I don't mind that. Yeah, that's what mine goes on to. You're right. 4666326. Now, because that's of that, yeah, that's something I definitely messed up. I would forget that it's always like what? Accuracy is plus and minus zero point zero zero one. Yeah, and so I would, it would say always be one off. Right, and I would say since you put three sig figs into, would you put two sig figs into A, and you only put, uh, but you put three sig figs in the height or something like that. Uh, so you really should only report G 
at best to let me see this. Yeah, that's like two sig figs on the height, and that's like three on that. Uh, you might be able to argue that you sh you can report nine point seven five, uh, but that's the uh, that really is pushing it. So nine point seven five <laughs> is what you should put for your slope, not the you know nine point seven five four three. Yeah, let me just double check. Let me get a much prettier graph. Um, versus 9.7543. Oh, that's right. What are we so doing? in that line G right there in that data, you're just going to put 9.75. 9.75. And um, the variable would still be meters per second squared. The yeah, the units, yes. Oh yeah, units. And then so this is just a regular calculation of friction divided by mass. That's actually the intercept. So oh, because we learned that from the equation. Exactly. Oh, that's funny. They mixed it up. So in that case, we got um, 0 0.01, negative 0 0.01. That's important. Yeah, it actually called it negative F over one. So you want the positive, not the not the negative. Yeah. So that was your intercept. Let's switch the over sign. Over. Yes, exactly. Because it had a minus F over M, and yours had a minus in front as well. So it's just that. So what they want you to do is take that 0.01 uh, and multiply that by the 0.2863. Whatever. I think it was 2863, the mass. That's what they're wanting in the line to the right. Uh, yes, for kilograms. Because mm -hmm. Newton's is in kilograms, 0 0.2863. 0 0.002. Okay. Um, so for significant figures for this one, so I'm getting something that's like, let's see, 2863. So it would only go like two across, but it wouldn't really be zero. Yeah, that, that zero in front of the one doesn't count as one, but I think you're justified in saying that is 0 0.010. So you just can round it. up because yeah. it's still some number, but it's not like a significant amount. Right. And remember, the F over M has to have units of meters per second per second. Oh, that's the same as gravity? Meters exactly. per second per uh, yeah. second? Yep. Notice it's force divided by M, so it should have the same units as, as A. And this would just be Newton's, yeah. You wrote that here. Okay. Would you prefer yeah. that I still write this out and then like do the thing just so you know I did the calculation? Yeah, so this is a calculation you haven't done before. So this is one that you should have a sample calculation on. Uh, you can you can underline, for instance, the six and the three there because they're clearly not significant. But the, you can argue because that F of rim, I think it might be okay to call that 0 0.010 just from the curve fit. But I wouldn't say there's more than two sig figs in that one. No, yeah, definitely not because this would be two. It's a, uh, yeah, I think you missed something there. Put 0 0.010 there. Because remember that zero is just in front of the one. Oh, this one. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, now zero it's in good. front of the one is not a significant digit. Awesome. Um, okay, so I think the rest of this looks not too bad at all then. Yeah. And remember Thank that was on the air track. That's why, that, that's why that friction force was so small. 0 0.002, you know, it was on a linear air track and, and that's its whole job is to reduce friction. So we did find a, a friction, but 0 0.002 Newtons is teeny, teeny force. And that's because the angle that the air track at was still like very minimal. It wasn't obviously a straight down drop. It was right. And the, bent horizontally. And the air track puts out that little cushion of air between the track and the actual cart and makes it nearly frictionless as well. Oh, okay. That's what we do those air tracks for. They're kind of cool that way.
Anything else? Yeah, you need? I always like watching those videos. No, <laughs> actually, um, I think you helped me out a lot with this. I'm gonna go back and touch everything up, like you said too. And I also just had one other little question. So after this, I'm all caught up, thankfully, uh, on labs, except for the last one was error propagation. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you gave me a zero for a hundred out of the attendance. I was there. Maybe I didn't type into the chat or something. Though. Oh, no. Uh, I think that one, I, I counted everybody as present if they were just there. But uh, I didn't actually take off any points for that. What I did take off uh, our ad points for was just turning it in on time. I think you might not have turned it in on time if you got a zero for that attendance. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it was. So if I turn in now, though, do I just get like a 50 or? Uh, no, that, so that doesn't hurt you until you've uh, either missed two labs or turned in two labs late or missed one lab and missed one lab and turned in one lab late. Once you've done two things, the next one results in a five point loss for attendance, not for the lab. It doesn't affect your, your uh, lab report grade. But 50% of your lab grade is your attendance grade. So it affects your attendance grade after the after two of them. That's okay. what if um, you look at the cumulative grade that it says in the grade book, that cumulative will say 100 until you missed one thing. And then it'll say uh, 99. And then if you miss a second thing, it'll say 98. But that's both of, all three of those cases, you're getting 100 still. Once you okay. miss another one, it'll drop to 95. That is a grade you're really going to get. Yeah, I think right now you have me down as a 90 out of 100. I, I think I know I handed in like three or two or three last week. Yeah, days. try not to turn in the end late. I might, you know, do something nice to help people out. We give them a little bit more than just two. But yeah, try not to be, try not to not show up and try not to not turn the labs in late because those do bite you in the rear. Yeah, thankfully I've shown up though, at least. <laughs> so yeah, I know, exactly. saw what, you know oh, what we're doing. I'm looking well, would you there. recommend then that I finish that and hand it in before midnight as well? And, or would you recommend that I just uh, take this, the error propagation as my exempt lab grade? Uh, no, the, uh, it, it, they're all gonna count. There's no quote unquote exempt lab grade. It's just once oh, you've okay. missed two things, either missed two labs or missed one lab and and turned one in late or turned in too late that's when you start losing points but like i said if you've got a 90 already that means that you uh already missed like four total that means you uh maybe missed two labs and turned two labs in late or missed four labs or turned in four labs late or something like that yeah uh, that's why i said just don't do it anymore maybe you'll get lucky and that'll turn back to a 90 or nine actually me a 95 or 100 I'm not sure uh, one thing I am noticing yeah. on the lab you've got shown on the screen right now, the mm -hmm. actual value you wrote is 2.7. Put that as uh, 2.699 for better results, even though it, it literally says it right above you. I, I don't know if you typed that in, but I gave you a better oh, the 2.7? Uh-huh. No, that it was in the addendum. Right? Yeah, they should have given you three sig figs on that. I don't know why the lab manual didn't, but anyways. Uh, and that's the 0.88% is still correct then. Yeah, yeah that's still great four or three and then it'd be two left. Okay. 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 Um, hey, Professor, so I guess I'll get this one turned in promptly and I'll get the air propagation one turned in as well and then I'm all caught up. Yep, and this, this is the one that's supposed to be turned in uh, today, right? The one that you're working on right now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, as long as you get that in by 11.59 tonight, you, you're golden, you won't get any points off for that. And I don't wanna give you any more points off, so make sure you just, you know, Make sure you're at lab and watch your lab grade attendance because the day of the lab, usually by about 45 minutes or an hour into lab, I've made the 50 out of 100 point calling already. Okay, Professor. Yeah, I'll try and be more on top of that. No problem. I just don't like to say, I know you're a good student and you work hard. I don't I would hate for you to lose points for no reason. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I think I think my grade slop uh, or slipped down to like a B so far, but I'm just trying to keep it at that for sure. <laughs> well, we'll get you shooting for DA, but have a good one, Mary. Thank you. You too, Professor. Have a good rest of your day. You too.